chapter 8, verse 27, God's word says this. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke this word openly. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Church, you may be seated at this time. <coughs> I want to begin by bidding you a good morning. Good morning, church. We trust that you enjoyed this last week of digging out, of shoveling snow after Sunday service, and certainly driving slow as the good Lord, I'm sure, answered the prayers of those among us who continue to say, we need the moisture, right? We need the moisture. Thanks, guys. Now, for the rest of us who desire global warming, please continue to pray that summer will come quickly. And, and, and you know, friends of mine agree with me when we say that, man, let it snow, but keep it in the mountains. Leave the city people alone. <coughs> well, today we begin a new month and a new day. And I certainly want to commend you for choosing to be here with us today. You've come to honor Jesus Christ. And he accepts that. He appreciates that. He knows it's effort. And he knows that, you know, you have to get up and it's cold. And if your water heater ever busts, it's even colder. But here you are. And so the father looks down and probably gives a little shove, you know, to his son. Look at them. You know, says, Dad, here they are. You know, here they are. They're, they're the ones that will spend eternity with us. And so you need to know that God is pleased. Let me share with you in the words of the author of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen? It is no secret that today might be that day. The author of Hebrews says, especially as you see the day approaching. What are we seeing? If someone was to ask you, well, what's different today than what was 40 years ago? Uh, they're flat out killing people on TV. They, are, they killed those 21 Coptic uh, uh, Christians. <coughs> which means Egyptian Christians, for that word Coptic. Uh, they're killing them everywhere. And, and our president says, it's not a religious war. And the rest of us say, yes, it is. It has been. Satan, from the very beginning of time, is going to destroy, wants to destroy, wants to take everyone down with him. And so if you are standing up for Jesus, if you are letting his light shine for you, don't expect to win Mr. or Miss Popularity in our world. It doesn't work that way. It's getting darker and darker. So, yes, indeed, today might be that day. And the day we're talking about is the rapture of the church. Understand, the Bible says that there is a second coming. Yes, there is a second coming to earth. But the Bible also taught and teaches us that the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive will be caught up, snatched out, and we will meet with the Lord. We'll be with him forever, but we will meet him in the clouds. That's not the second coming. The second coming is after those seven years that you and I have been perfected, that we come down and, and help govern the new earth. When Jesus comes back to the earth again, he is going to set up a kingdom for 1,000 years. You've been called to be part of that. And no, you're not going to be working at Big O. You're not going to be working at Walmart. He has called us to be kings and priests. That's your job title. That's what you're going to do. You're going to help rule for Jesus. And those who survive, those who come, and those who are multiplied in the earth from then on, they're going to ask you, who is this guy? 
Who is this person on the throne? And you get to talk about Jesus. Jesus. At the end of the thousand years, they'll have an opportunity as well. Have they accepted them? Accepted him or have they not? And what a surprise that many, after living in a perfect environment, a perfect world, will still not accept Jesus. The Lord is done with them. The Lord removes us again. And this earth, this tierra, this dirt is, is over with. And behold, a new heaven and a new earth. We will live forever with the Lord. That's it in a nutshell. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. No, just kidding. <laughs> a secret. We talk about a secret. A secret has been defined as something you tell one person at a time. And from time to time, Jesus shared special secrets with his disciples. And some are given here as we continue with the rest of the scripture. Now, as believers today, we need to understand and apply these spiritual secrets if our own lives are to be all that God wants them to be. So let's begin. Look at your Bible. So we have you have a Bible. Verse 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? Let's put up the map again so we can orientate you to where Caesarea Philippi was. We were just there a few weeks ago. And I uh, uh, want you to kind of become familiar with this region in Israel. And so you see up in the top, if we have a little, anybody have a little red little marker? I forgot mine. And uh, all right. So let's uh, high beam the top, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, where did the marker go? There you go. So we're up there, Caesarea Philippi. And you can see the area that we're talking about. Now, this is where there's going to be a turn of event. Let's leave the map up there for just a bit, and uh, we can talk about some things. Okay, so Caesarea, this is the place Jesus has been preparing his disciples. And so they're moving up towards Caesarea Philippi, and he, ha he wants a private, all-hands meeting with the boys, with his disciples, if you may. And in his, his, in his meeting, he intends to reveal to them what will happen to him at Jerusalem. Now, as you can see, Caesarea Philippi is at the, located on the, to the north of the Sea of Galilee. And the Lord Jesus it was in the north, and from here, he is going to turn south, and he's going to begin to go all the way down to Jerusalem. If you can see it there, um, Jerusalem. Can you see it there? Mm, that's in Galilee. Nope, we're too high up. All right. So anyway, he's going to go all the way down to Jerusalem. So as they, as they, he's going to go down to Jerusalem, but he's going to go to the cross. And so he has something to say to the boys. He has something to say to those guys. He has a secret to reveal to them. So as they headed towards Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had given them hints along the way. But now he would explain the whole enchilada, as we would say, right? Now he chose this site, Caesarea Philippi, a town about 25 miles north of Bethsaida. Bethsaida was where we talked about last week, uh, down at the beginning of the Galilee, at uh, the top of the Galilee. And, and it's 25 miles, if you may, uh, north of Bethsaida. And it sits at the a foot of beautiful Mount Hermon. Can you see Mount Hermon on top? Let's see, we still have that little light on. Mount Hermon. But we want to say it the way the Jewish people were saying it to us. Mount Hermon. You know, and, and when I was looking at it, my goodness, if we do that in Colorado, we go, everybody, oh, he's going to spit, right? No, that's just the way they talk. Mount Hermon. You know, so we always say Mount Hermon. No, it's not Mount Hermon. You know, it's Mount Hermon. So I'm going to know if you've been listening because the next time we talk about this subject, if you're saying, oh, yeah, we're up at Mount Hermon. Yeah, look, yeah. And you live in La Jolla, California, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, come on. You know, so it's Mount Hermon for whatever. All right. I want to give you a little history before we move on. The town, Caesarea Philippi, was named after Augustus Caesar and Herod Philip. And it contained a marble temple dedicated to Augustus, if you may. It was, it, was, uh, uh, it was a place dedicated, Caesarea Philippi, the whole place was dedicated to the glory of Rome, to the glory of Rome. And, of course, that glory is now gone, but the glory of Jesus Christ remains and will go on throughout eternity. Amen? Amen. Church, the guys knew where they were at. It is no different than you and I if we're going to uh, L.A. or we're going towards uh, Southern California and we're, gonna, we're approaching Las Vegas. As we're approaching Las Vegas, or if you fly into New York and you're going into the financial district, Manhattan Island, if you may, 
you see all those icons. You see huge buildings. You see, like in Vegas, all the things that are going on, and it's the world. It is everything that man has put together. It is the things of the world. So with all these worldly icons going on or ahead of them, Jesus turns to the disciples and he looks at them and says, Hey guys, hey guys, a little time out here. Let me get your attention. Who do men say that I am? Verse 28, look at your Bibles. So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah and others one of the prophets. Church, are you just not amazed that with everything that had been going on at that time, that the people still back then thought about Jesus just as one of these great guys. Even after all he did, even after everything he did, they're, they're equating him to the prophets, to John the Baptist, which it's not a bad estimation. Don't misunderstand that. It is a high opinion about Jesus. So the uh, people acknowledge him to be a great man. However, you know, it's kind of like in our world today, right? Western Colorado, hey, who is Jesus? Oh, you know, he's a great man, he's a prophet, he was here a little while back, you know, and uh, blah, 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 he's a great man. Uh, one of the greatest probably, you know. If that is your opinion, is if that is how you honor him, then church understand, just like it was back then and just like it is today, it is a dishonor an actual dishonor to the Lord Jesus to consider him like one of the prophets, to consider him like John the Baptist, if you may. Listen to me, church. If Jesus is not God, if he is not God, then he is a deceiver. If Jesus is not God, then he is a madman. If Jesus is not God, then he is nothing more than a legend. That's all he was. And if that's who he is in your heart, you have missed it. You have missed it, who this Jesus was, who we just celebrated communion. We know what he was saying to the guys, and they had no idea the death that he would go through. The cruelty to go on that cross, to take our place, to pay for your sins and my sins. If Jesus, if all you have is a high opinion of him, then you've done him a dishonor. He is God in the flesh. He is our Savior. He is the soon coming King to fix this whole earth of ours. He'll be here soon. And so this is who he is. There's no other possibility that, that he's something other than who he is. So first part of verse 29, check it out. Look at your Bible. He said to them, after they had said this and that, but who do you say that I am? Ah, now it comes to something personal. Who do you say that I am? Find that the masses and everybody at Walmart thinks he's a great guy. Find that everybody over here in, on towns and says that he's a great guy. Who do you say Jesus is? It's a personal question. So the disciples, understand, have been with Jesus now almost three years, two and a half years. Uh, they were within six months now of the cross. So this question, who do you say that I am, it's kind of like a final exam. And it's kind of like when I talk to you if you're in the hospital and there's something serious going on with you, or I get called to ICU, or I get called to the emergency room because something has happened. I'm going to ask you one more time, so tell me about Jesus. Oh, you're either going to tell me he's my Lord, or you're going to start backpedaling. Well, you know, I've always gone to church. I was good to my neighbors. I was good to my mother-in-law. That's a miracle, isn't it, Pastor? No, no. Oh, hang on. Being a good person does not get you to heaven. And whoever is telling you that is lying and is working for Satan. No one is good, is what the Bible says. None of us have reached perfection. We need a Savior, or it's all in vain why God sent his son to take our place on Calvary's cross. Who do you say I am? Verse 29, the second part, look at your Bible. Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Now, church, note this. Note this. This is the best thing that Simon Peter ever said. And yes, I think he spoke for the guys. You are the Christ. Now, church, note the word Christ. Christ, so that you know what Peter is saying, Christ is not a name. Jesus is his name. Christ is a title. In the Hebrew, it was Messiah, which Messiah means the anointed one. So he is the one spoken about in Genesis. 
when God addresses the serpent and says, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Someone is coming from the seed of the woman. He is the one that Moses talked about. There will be raised among our people, among you people, a savior. He is the one that the prophets talked about. And he is the one that was promised by God. So Jesus came to fulfill all that and, yes, even to reveal to us who God is. Now, Peter's confession was courageous. Peter's confession was confident. And may I say to you, so should yours. If people ask you, do you follow Jesus? Some of us kind of like, oh, yes, but don't tell anybody. I'm what they call a secret Christian, you know. And maybe we put on sunglasses. Hey, maybe there's no such thing. If they're dying on the other side of the pond in the Middle East for being Christian, do you think that word's not going to come over here? Do you really, really think that America, America, who we used to always sing America the Great, who has now adopted homosexuality, who has now adopted just about every vile thing that can possibly go on and has embraced it as a whole, that you cannot watch a TV show, you know, without it showing all this junk, right? Do you think that America, if she does not repent, that she's going to be spared? Years ago, Bible uh, teacher and, and evangelist Billy Graham said, if America does not repent, God owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how bad we have become as a nation. And in our nation leadership, who refuse to see that it's a religious war that's going on over there. You know, I mean, it's just like take, putting the people to sleep. But you should know that if you stand up for Jesus Christ, it is not going to be an easy road. Well, the guys did not know this. The guys are thinking Jesus who is healing, Jesus who is performing miracles. How could the world not follow this man? Jesus, who is a good man, but is a perfect, not more than a good man, a perfect man, a sinless man, how could it not finish well? This is what is in their head. So after Peter's confession and after the guys agreed, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the anointed one, you're the one that the whole Old Testament talked about. Look at verse 30. Then he, speaking about Jesus, strictly warned them that they should, uh, that they should tell no one about him. Church, doesn't it seem strange that Jesus would caution them not to tell anyone? Why would he do this? Why would the Lord do this? Well, let's consider, let's think about this for just a second. Number one, this thought. For starters, the disciples themselves, like you and me, still had much to learn about Jesus. Amen? How about you and I today? Do you still have something? Does anybody here need to learn more about Jesus? Raise your hand. Yeah. Most of us have not perfected this. We need to learn more about Jesus, especially the guys back then. Secondly, just food for thought, the disciples then and us, to, you know, and us today needed to learn what it truly means to follow Jesus. Now, they're going to follow him, but is that what the Lord is saying, follow me down to Jerusalem? Is that all he is saying? What does it mean to you and I today to follow him? Next week, if you're here with us next week, we go into that part of discipleship, what it means to follow the Lord. But to follow him, we don't get it. If you come to the Lord today and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. When I ask for forgiveness of my sins, I want to trust that he will forgive my sins and write my name in the Lamb's book of life. What do I do next? And we say to you, well, follow the Lord. All right. Sorry, I'm a practical guy. I'm probably a D minus disciple. Right. What do I, how do I follow him? What does that mean to me, right? So they did not know what it truly meant to follow him. And so, and so today we know, and next week we're going to go into that, so I won't go into that today. But finally, you know, uh, the disciples, unlike us today, unlike us today, they had to wait until the gospel story was complete. Had no idea of resurrection had no idea that three days later he would rise again, right? So the religious leaders of the nation had already made up their minds about Jesus. And so to proclaim him as Messiah for sure was not God's plan. 
The common people wanted to see his miracles, but they had little desire to submit to his message. And so now it is time to share a secret with his disciples that believed in him. Verse 31. Look at your Bible. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. <coughs> Let's put that up on the screen. Listen to what the guys are listening to, okay? There are four things that come out of verse 31, okay? Jesus, first of all, does not reveal his person apart from his work of redemption. Salvation depends on who he is and what he did. And so when you look at verse 31, you know, you're saying, oh, he must suffer? Yeah, he must suffer. And he, he must be rejected? Yes, he must be rejected. And he must be killed? Yes, he will be killed. And rise again? Yes, rise again. Now, if someone was recruiting Christians and they said to you, hey, come and join the Lord. Okay, what's in it for me? Well, first of all, you're going to suffer. Probably your family is going to call you a reject. You know, what are you doing? You know, thirdly, you know, they're probably going to kill you for standing up for Jesus. But in the end, in for eternity, you will rise again on the right side. Well, it's kind of hard to swallow. But this is what reality is for Jesus. And the disciples are bringing this in. They've already called him Messiah. They've already confessed this. And it's hard for them. So, listen, now that the disciples again have passed their final test, they know who he is. Again, they have confessed their faith. Now their final part of their training begins here. Church, it was in Caesarea Philippi that he first revealed the cross to them. And so the disciples must have been confused. Did Jesus, did Jesus the Messiah just plainly say that, one, he must suffer, two, be rejected, three, be killed, four, rise again. Did he really say that? And they're looking at each other and finding, this was the secret? This was the secret? Yes. Yes. And now that they have confessed their faith in Christ, the disciples were ready for the secret that Jesus wanted to share with them. He was going to Jerusalem with them where he would die on a cross. Now, again, if you and I were there, it would have been a hard thing to swallow. We did not know that suffering is always before glory. We wouldn't have known that. And unless you have been taught that, you would think it's ridiculous. And that's why Jesus would never say something if he didn't model it through. That's why he's your example. What did they do to him? What might they do to you? And if you don't have this up here and they come to you and say, we're killing all the Christians right now, so you have a chance. You either renounce him, which means I'm not a Christian, I'm not a follower of Christ, or no, I am a follower of Christ. If you do not know up here in your mind and have resolved that, that he is the Lord, he is God, and it hasn't come down to your heart, you will not be able to die for the Lord. Many people have said, and I said this to you last week, they said, you know, if that tribulation ever really starts and you guys take off and you're up in the clouds and, and we're left and the Antichrist rises up and whatnot and he starts putting 666, I think at that time I will become a believer. And I think that at that time I will be able to live my life for him. I'm telling you this. Sober up. You are deceiving yourself. If you cannot live for Christ today, you will not be able to die for him tomorrow. There's no way that can happen. Today, when they make fun of you, eh, eh, Christian, we're not going to call you to our party. You know, we're not going to invite you. And yeah, your feelings are hurt probably a little bit, but is that suffering really? Well, Reed and, and, and Landers, some people say, oh, they don't, they don't call me friends anymore. You know, it's not suffering, church. We haven't even begun as some of you have crossed the ocean here. So this was the secret, right? Now, this announcement what Jesus just said, what we just pulled out of verse 31, it shocked the disciples. And for a minute, let's uh, try and reason with them. You know, what were they thinking? You could bring this down there. If he were indeed the Christ, and they had as they had confessed, 
then why would he be rejected by the religious leaders? Aren't these guys the ones in charge? I, I mean, aren't the priests the ones that lead everybody to the Lord? Aren't, don't you trust every pastor? Church, do you trust everyone that's wearing a little cap and a big old cross and, and a collar? I brought a black collar today so I could show you my, no, just kidding. Uh, do you trust pastors that would tell you, hey, well, let's go to South America. There's this little place called Diana over there. And, and uh, I think that all you guys should be like me and let's just drink this Kool-Aid. And so that pastor killed everyone that followed him, right? Americans were shocked when that happened. How about this guy in Waco, Texas a few years ago? Or Waco, Texas, whatever it was called, you know. But there's another one. Are you following pastors? Are you following priests or are you following Jesus? Are you following the Jesus of the Bible? Are you following the rumors and little things you have heard? Have you begun to read your Bible? Do you own your own Bible? Where are you? America, have we fallen asleep again? Have we fallen asleep like Bethlehem and Jerusalem that did not realize that their king had been born to them on that Christmas day? Where are we with Jesus Christ? Are we serious about him? Or are we just playing church? Are we just playing church? Wow. They're thinking, again, why would the leaders crucify him? They're thinking, did not the Old Testament scriptures promise that Messiah would defeat all their enemies and establish a glorious kingdom for Israel? <coughs> Church, there was something wrong somewhere, and the disciples were confused, and you can't blame them. And let me share this with you. Yes, the Old Testament scriptures promised that Messiah would defeat all its enemies, but here's the deal. Any coin that you have has two sides, two faces. And the priests, religious leaders, had focused only on the millennial kingdom. On the millennial kingdom, when Jesus would come back to the earth again, when he would rule. Where he would rule from Israel, from Jerusalem. Where he would touch his foot on the Mount of Olives when he comes. And it's still it's what he's going to do. And that mountain would split. That the waters from the Mediterranean Sea would cross all the way to the Dead Sea, where the Jordan dumps into and it would revive it all over again. Yes, that's true. But if you only tell the church, if you only tell the people those things and don't give them the other side of the coin, it's not balanced. And therefore, we walk around too heavy on one side and nothing on the other side instead of being a balanced Christian. Verse 32, look at your Bibles. He spoke this word openly. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Note your Bible here. It doesn't say that Peter took him aside and he rebuked him once. It's okay if he says, oh, Lord, come on, man. What are you talking about, Jesus? You are this God that's done all these miracles. What are you talking about? Let's not talk about, let's not talk about death. Let's not talk about suffering. Let's not talk about that, you know, these cruel things you just talked about. No, it says that he began so he must have continued for a little bit. He began to rebuke him. What does this tell us also? Another thing it tells us is that, you know, that even now the disciples, they weren't ready for this. And sometimes when you come to Christ, you're not ready for your family to reject you. Man, Mom, I thought you'd be glad that I'm off drugs. Uh, Mom, I thought you'd be glad that I'm not an alcoholic anymore. Mom, I thought you'd be glad that I'm trying to get back with my wife. Yeah, well, I don't know, but you're taking this Jesus thing a little bit too serious. I, I'd rather have you the other way, messed up. And that's how some parents are. They don't want to hear that you started to follow Jesus. So now Peter, who had just said the best thing ever, right, in verse 29, the second part, he says the worst thing ever. <laughs> he began to rebuke Jesus. <coughs> Sometimes that's like you and me, huh? One day we say, one time we're saying something, oh man, wasn't church great and this and that. And someone crosses the street right in front of you. Hey, you dummy, why don't you watch me? You know, and the wife says, weren't you just saying how great church was? You know, or you start yelling at the poor waitress at Denny's because she's not fast enough. Went to a new Mexican restaurant. I don't know why I go off these things, but I'm hungry again. No, uh, here in town. I have never been in this building before because when I came here 20 years ago, I used to hear, oh, it's messed up place. Oh, don't go there. Oh, don't go there. Don't go there. So I've never been there. Six months ago, more or less, someone took over this restaurant. It's an, another new Mexican restaurant. Do we need another one in Montrose? I'll let you answer that. Okay. But, 
but I went to it. It's right next to, if you may, the bowling alley or behind Ted's Bay Park, a little sombrero-looking thing, right? I haven't been there, have not been there, but I have some friends that went and says, dude, it's the real McCoy. McCoy? It's supposed to be Mexican food. You know, no, wow, we're men, it's a real deal, Ben. You know, it's a beaner's delight. Ah, now you're talking my language, right? I went there for the very first time on Friday. One girl was serving. I kind of looked at it. People started coming in. It's like a quarter to five, and uh, people started coming in. And this girl uh, was, like, making circles, doing this, doing that. She was doing everything, you know, kind of employee you all want, you know. I mean, just amazing. People were packing the place. They were coming in. And before we knew it, like a team of five other waitresses and waiters came in, and they started doing it. Now, I was there one hour. You know, it, it took that long. But mama mia, when they brought that plate, oh, my word. I mean, I've eaten at Fiesta's. I've eaten at the El Jimador. I've eaten at the best of the best. The Lord, look at me. You know, you can tell. The Lord has done a great job. <laughs> but I got to tell you, this is Montes Best Secret right now. This place was fabulous. And the way they prepared it, you can tell these guys are cooking in the kitchen right there. Be, you know, right there. And they brought it out. And I said to Judy, I'm done with fiestas in El Jimador for a while. I am going to not OD in this place, but I'm going to continue to um, go to this place. I was blown away. And, and uh, it's been a long time since, you know, you always get chips and a little salsa and a little cabbage, and that's good enough, right? How about chips? You know, how about that salsa and some little refried beans there for us bean lovers, you know? I was blown away. I, I told Judy, I'm going to come again. I couldn't finish it. Because, you know, remember last time Toy made me eat that third burrito and I was sick for three days. But uh, I took my burrito home. And so yesterday when I came back from jail, <laughs> I'm a chaplain. <laughs> Get your head straight. So when I came back to jail, I put it in on the microwave three minutes. Oh, my goodness. With the rice and beans. I never usually take that home anymore either. But I did from this restaurant. And I got to tell you. Huh, I'm not going to tell you anymore. Don't get there before I do. You guys stay and pray. I'm going to go and check for it. <laughs> now, but it was a great place. Why did I go there? Okay. So, uh, Peter, who had just said the best thing ever, says the worst thing ever. 33, but when he turned around and looked at his disciples, I forgot why I went there. Anyway, I'll come back to you. He rebuked Peter. Look at your Bible. He rebuked Pe Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, there's a comma. He's not calling them the devil. He's saying, get behind me, comma, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Church, again, it's kind of like us. Peter, one minute, he's led by the Lord. He confesses him, his faith in him. And the next minute, he's, he was thinking like an unbelieving man and expressing the thoughts of Satan. So let's make an observation here. Note that Jesus first looked at his disciples, and then he rebuked Peter. As if to say, when he looked at his disciples, then came back to Peter, if I don't go to the cross, how can these, my disciples, be saved? Now think about it for you and I today. If Jesus had not gone to the cross, who would save us today? Who would convict us of our sin? Who would tell us that, dude, we're messed up, and if we keep going that way, we're going to wind up in hell? But there's God's gift to us. There's an exit plan, and it's Jesus Christ. So he looks at him. Now, church, what Peter said to the Lord was simply out of love for him. However, it was born out of ignorance of God's will. Again, one minute Peter was a rock, and the next he was a stumbling block. <coughs> In the words of Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, he said, quote, the man who loves Jesus but who shuns God's method is a stumbling block to him, the Lord, end of quote. Peter did not yet understand the relationship between suffering and glory. He would eventually, you know, he'll eventually learn this lesson, and he would emphasize it in his first epistle, the first book that he wrote. So church, Jesus called these men to follow him, and they knew that whatever happened to him would happen to them. If there was a cross in Jesus' future, there would be one in their future as well. And now, thinking about this, it would be reason enough to disagree with him. In spite of their devotion to him, 
the disciples were still ignorant of the true relationship between the cross and the crown. They were following what we would say is Satan's philosophy, which is glory without suffering, instead of God's philosophy, which is suffering transformed into glory. Now think about this. If we bring in or someone lead someone to Christ, and we only tell them, oh, my goodness, from this point on, there'll always be a spring to your step. I can't even jump anymore here. Too many gorillas. Spring to your step, right? If you come and follow Jesus, oh, your world is going to be great. There'll be wealth, there'll be health, and there'll be prosperity. If you just stay on that theme, you are talking about the world's philosophy. You are talking about the world's philosophy. Because glory as a Christian, to receive your crown, you must give up your life and follow Jesus. Again, next week we're going to get into that part about following Jesus. And following Jesus is not very popular today, back then, or whatever. If it got Jesus killed, is there a possibility that you may be killed for the gospel as well? Absolutely so. You need to understand that again. It needs to register up here. And it has to come down to the heart so that we can follow the Lord. You have to be balanced. It's not an easy thing to be a Christian. You're not going to like being the one that people make jokes of. You're not going to be the, you're not going to like it that you're not Mr. Popular. Or they pass you up on promotion. You're not going to like those things. But the Bible says at the end of this life, which is just temporal, 70 years has been given to man, right? 80 is be as strong. That is a norm. Yes, we know that there's people that live up to 100 plus, And we know that there's people that die in their 50s. Look at the obituaries and even younger. But this is the, the norm, 70 to 80 years. This is just a minute little dot compared to eternity. Will one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's just the way it is. So you need to decide who you're going to serve. May I ask you, as we close, what philosophy are you following? You cannot follow both. The philosophy you accept will determine how you will live and how you will serve. We live in beautiful western Colorado, in the western slope of Colorado. And more important than whom do people here say that Jesus is, is this. If Jesus was to ask you, who do you say that I am? Would you pass the final exam, as Peter did? Would you pass that exam? Will we be able to say with boldness and confidence, you are the Christ? I trust that you would, even though you might suffer before glory, even though there might be a crown of thorns for you as well, even though it would be tough now. But hang in there. Eternity awaits us. 